Right. Building new communities. Uh, first of all, obviously, when you're working like that, it's important to know who you're dealing with. So I thought I'd just introduce myself quickly. I was trained as a computational scientist, although I actually worked with computers uh, for about five years uh, before I, I took my degree. I'm a Yorkshireman. In Yorkshire, we say we've got uh, long pockets and short arms. It's not that we're mean. It's just that we're careful with our money. And I've been involved in, in community development in information technology uh, for quite a long time, most recently with the Python Software Foundation. And one of my special interests is, is trying to make communities more diverse. So um, about 20 years ago, coming up to 20 years ago, I thought that, that open source was likely to be significant. And so I decided to try and experiment. And you've probably heard people come to open source conferences and say, well, open source has given us so much, we decided we'd like to give something back. Well, I decided as an experiment just to try and see what happened if you gave something without waiting to get something first. And so I've basically spent the last 20 years giving back to the Python world in the fond expectation that one day it will actually be worth something to me. And the time plan was 20 years. I'm 18 and a half years into that plan now, and I've given up as Python Software Foundation chairman, so I can focus on, on my business again. So that's me. Who's the, uh, the Apache Software Foundation? Well, of course, none of, these, none of these bullet points are strictly true. But if you don't belong to the Apache Software Foundation, and if you're not a part of the, the Apache community, then it could very well seem that way. To some people, we are outrageous nerds who have you know, no idea what the real world's like. The difference between an introverted geek and an extroverted geek is the introverted geek looks at his own feet when he's talking at you, and the extroverted geek looks at your feet when he's talking to you, that kind of stuff. Very, very commonplace misperceptions of geeks. So, uh, I did just want to underline at the start of these remarks that I'm, I'm not uh, either a member of the Python Software Foundation or, uh, sorry, of the Apache Software Foundation or the Apache community. So I have to confess that some of my remarks uh, are likely to be based on ignorance, and I just wanted to make that clear. So uh, I'm perfectly happy uh, to stand corrected at any point if, if people have information that I wasn't, uh, that I wasn't privy to. So. Um, in my attempt to broaden the Python community, we had people uh, towards the beginning of my, my efforts saying, well, wh why are you trying to get the Python Software Foundation to market itself? We don't do marketing. We're, we're, you know, we're techies. We're tech heads. We don't do that kind of stuff. We don't need lawyers. Uh, of the three remarks that I've, I've bulleted up on the screen there, the, the worst one, unfortunately, was a remark I was forced to make uh, when we, we had a disastrously expensive PyCon one year due to a, a severe downturn in the economy. And uh, if we hadn't actually had to, to defer those trademark mark applications, then we wouldn't now be involved in negotiations with someone who was trying to register a Python trademark in the UK. Um, fortunately, it does look as though that issue is going to be amicably settled, but it would never have arisen had we been able to go forward and and reserve those trademarks. So that's, of course, one of the things that foundations do. A part of the intellectual property uh, of, of the Apache brand, if you like, is the very name Apache and, and the feather symbol. And it's simply a matter of fact that in trademark law, if you are not seen to zealously look for abuses of your trademark and defend them, then your trademark can actually become uh, effectively public domain. That happened, for example, to uh, Xerox, which became a... a um, effectively a, 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 a generic name for copying technology, and Hoover became a generic name uh, for vacuum cleaners. So, um, in this world, people are going to think things about you, so it's up to you to decide. Are you going to try to, to direct those thoughts, or are you just going to let people uh, choose to think what they want to do? Uh, and I think some of the confusing things uh, that might be confusing to outsiders, certainly it's the case in the Python world, is people don't really uh, 
understand the relationship between the Python Software Foundation itself and, and the much, much larger Python community. I think at the moment the, the Python Foundation, Software Foundation, has maybe, um, if we're lucky, 250 members at most. And yet the, the worldwide Python community is, is in the hundreds of thousands now. So how do we claim to be representative of a community that size? And how do we actually exercise any kind of, of leadership over that community? These, these are very important questions. And the easiest way to try to project a message, particularly when you're trying to project that message through a root and branch community, is to start with clear values. If you can communicate your core values effectively, then people know instantly, uh, simply by referring to the values, what the right course of action is in, in certain circumstances. And of course, it also means that um, you're more likely to be perceived in the ways that your, your core values indicate you'd like to be, uh, and it makes it easier to actually communicate the, the fundamental purpose uh, of your existence. And it, it isn't easy uh, to manage perceptions, and it, it's not something that you can do in, in a year even, or, or two years. You can't turn on a dime. And, and when I was thinking of how I could make that clear, I, I was reminded of the story of the college lawn. I don't know how many of you have been to Cambridge in England, uh, but some of the colleges there, and I believe Magdalen College in particular, have wonderful, wonderful lawns, these huge expanses of, of dead flat grass, many of them with majestic trees standing in the middle. And, and the story is told of how an American tourist uh, was talking to the groundsman at one of these colleges, and he said, you know, I'd really like a lawn like that. He said, is it, is it difficult? He said, no, sir, it's not at all difficult to make a lawn like that. He said, oh, how do you do it? He said, well, first of all, you, you level the ground and you, and you plant your seed and you let it grow a bit and then you roll it. Yeah. He said, and then you mow it. Yeah. And then you roll it again. Yeah. And then you mow it again. Yeah. And if you do that for about 300 years, you get a really nice piece of grass. So... Some efforts take a long time. And um, my, the parent company of the Open Bastion, which is the company that's producing this, Holden Web, um, even when it was only a one-man business, it managed to get a Google page rank of five for its website. And people you ask, used to ask me how I did that. And it's a, it's a very similar story, really. What you do is you make sure that your website and your name are in your email signature, and then you spend about eight years making approximately 200,000 contributions to various different technical news groups where you're helping people with their problems. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, there's this mesh of, of, of web references pointing to your website. So you can change perceptions. You can adjust perceptions. But you can't expect it to be a quick job. And when it comes to building community, my Brazilian friend Enrique Bastos said it very well. He said, really, the, the goal is not, if, if you want to build a community, the best way to do it isn't to, to just try and do that as an abstract affair. What you should do is you should hold events. And the people who come to your events are your community. And that's really the way it's, it's certainly worked with, uh, with Python. I started PyCon. We had the first PyCon in 2003. And this year, we had 250 people, I think, there that, that time. And this year, the 11th one, uh, it's a sellout at 2,500. So you can grow communities, uh, but that involves teaching. And teaching, as I know because a part of my professional responsibilities involve teaching, teaching is, is not an easy job. It's one that demands uh, a lot of preparation. And generally speaking, I, I don't think that teaching, and particularly the teaching of children, is sufficiently well valued today in, in modern societies. But uh, it's always interesting to reflect on whether we are actually as, as clever as we think we are. And I, I heard a really interesting story. For, for some reason, um, I think by accident rather than design, but for some reason, a crate of XO machines, that's the, the one laptop per child machine, uh, a crate of those machines was delivered to a village. And this village was so poor and there was such a low level of literacy that they didn't even have street signs. And uh, so the, the crate of XOs was delivered there, and they just thought, well, you know, we, we can't put the support services that we normally do in to, 
explain to the kids how to use it and so on, but hey, we've got the machines there. Let's just see how they do. And this bunch of illiterate African village kids within six months had rooted that, that, those computers. They got full control over the hardware, bypassing protections that had been built in and designed by fairly significant computer scientists. So I think when we, t when we think about teaching, I think we have to stop using the paradigm that teaching is always about someone with superior education trying to pass information to, to someone who doesn't possess it. It's not necessarily about that. When we're trying to teach, we need to be unafraid to actually learn as we're teaching. I ran a, a session at PyCon about eight years ago called Teach Me Twisted because I wanted to understand about a, a particular technology, the twisted networking technology in, in the Python world. And so I just stood up in front of the audience and said, look, this is stuff I know nothing about, so I'm just going to try and stand here and learn it publicly. And I had you know, members of the Twisted uh, team in the audience, and I started out with a, a simple question, you know, how do I access my website in Twisted? And before anyone really knew it, we were deep into reasons why particular design decisions had been made and that kind of stuff. But the point is that teachers now shouldn't expect to be the possessors of all knowledge. They shouldn't expect to be in a privileged position simply by virtue of, of the possession uh, of certain knowledge. Teaching is a skill which involves explaining to growing people uh, of all ages how to use their, their faculties to solve the problems that they need. And teachers, of course, being people too, they have their own problems. And I think open source is, is actually helping to make the, the teaching world, the education world better. Um, the way that now the academic world has embraced the idea of open publication and, and realized that it's ridiculous uh, to spend huge amounts of money uh, public money funding research of various kinds and then to have the results of that research locked up behind what are really ridiculous and, and perhaps even unjustifiably expensive paywalls. Uh, and of course there are technologies now, this, the, the piece of hardware that I, I have in my hand here, I doubt that the camera will be able to show any adequate representation of it, but this is called a Teensy board. It's about the same size as a 20-pin dual inline integrated circuit package, which 20 years ago would maybe be a dynamic RAM controller or something like that. And it's, it's a full Arduino spec machine, which can control hardware of various kinds. Um, this machine, which is a, a particular favorite of mine because it was designed with Python as the programming language in mind, the Raspberry Pi is a $35 computer with two USB sockets, uh, an Ethernet lead, uh, a, a composite video, and an HDMI output, and access to various programmable digital pins as well. And these tools uh, have come about because the hardware world has started to adopt the same design ethos that, that the software world has. And of course, when it comes to open source in the software world, the Apache Software Foundation is the leader. There's, there's no doubt about it. So. You've got this thing of being a, a meritocracy. And so one of, the, one of the things I'm interested in is, well, how do you actually market a meritocracy to people? Do people actually want to be, you know, do people want to join? When somebody hears, well, the Apache Software Foundation is a meritocracy, what do they actually make of that? And the, the problem is, of course, that um, perception is, is actually reality. I mean, it's perfectly okay to have a meritocracy, but you need to communicate. Now, of course, when I did uh, a bit more research, I found out that the, 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 the question of merit doesn't have a central definition. In fact, the, the foundation quite sensibly leaves it to each of the, the PMCs to determine who has merit and how they've, they've demonstrated merit. So I was actually quite relieved to see that there isn't somewhere a stone tablet with a definition of merit written on it, and you, you know, everyone has to be uh, forced through the hole, and if not too much flesh scrapes off, then they've got merit and they're, they're allowed through the door kind of thing. Um, and I think that the, the foundation's done extremely well to get the, these, what is it now, 180 projects, something like that, if you include the podlings, 
uh, all these projects going. But at, at the same time, I have to wonder, because I know from my own experience in the Python Software Foundation, it's sometimes difficult to do necessary things without administration. I have to wonder if maybe the foundation isn't, isn't a bit light in certain areas. And I do know in, in the software world, the things that tend to get dropped on the floor are the things that nobody really wants to do anyway. And, and the open source world's really convenient like that. Nobody can come and say, well, you've got to do this then. We have to herd cats. We can't compel people. Um, now, when people are making history, it's very unusual for them to actually realize it. So if, if I tell you now that for the past 30 or 40 years, the software world has been making history, you, you might think I'm burbling. And, you know, it's, it's not a matter of, um, of much concern to me whether I'll be proved correct or not, because over the, the, the time scale I've got left on this, this earth, it's very oh. unlikely that anyone will be able to make any sensible conclusions. But we have to remember that, that we as technologists are defining the systems which will operate, the, which will determine the way that the world works. And that gives us a, a considerable degree of, of power. And of course, with, with power comes responsibility. So we need to think uh, about how we're going to shape technology and, and how that's going to affect the people whose lives are affected ultimately by it, who are principally the end users who have to consume the technology without necessarily getting much say at all into, into how it gets developed or, or to what shape it has. And I mean, thinking about, for example, something as, as complex as the law, which is you know, our law in, in this country is, what, 300 years old now, something like that, a bit more. Um, if we ever had a piece of software 300 years old, of course, we'd, we'd probably think it need refactoring. It was interesting to hear what the, the panel said about a software, a piece of software with a lifetime of, uh, of 50 years. But w the world is changing, and, and we're responsible uh, for those changes. Now, when you look at economic theory, um, the theory of, you know, when I can understand economists and econometricians, they want to represent their, their field as a science. And so in order for economics uh, to be a, a respectable science, then there has to be something called the economy. But in actual fact, um, I've been reading a book recently called Debt, the First 5,000 Years. Uh, and it turns out that, that uh, the, the economic myth is that before money existed, <clears throat> we had to have barter systems, and so you would trade four chickens for a sheep or whatever, which was okay as long as you know, the guy who had the sheep needed the four chickens that you could offer him. Now, in actual fact, that's, that's not the way that barter-based systems work at all. It turns out, after considerable research, that the way barter systems work is that people uh, simply help their neighbors out when they are in some way socially, usually it would be social forces that would, that would make someone help their neighbor. You, know, you, you can imagine if you live in a closed community of, of a small number of people, uh, if you start to behave like an asshole to your neighbors, then word is going to get around and people aren't going to help you. So there's a certain amount of, of mutual support there. There's, you can compel people to, to not behave too much like an asshole simply by withholding your support from them. And, you know, in some cases, maybe once every three months or once every six months, there'd be a big meeting and, you know, Angela would say, well, Gillian owes me a chicken and Gillian would say, well, right, but Sam's got three pigs of mine, this kind of stuff. There'd be a reckoning. Uh, many debts would cancel each other out and, and they'd go forward with, with the debts resolved. So debt has actually, exi actually existed before currency in terms of a recorded, even an informally recorded obligation to repay something that, that somebody gave you. And if you want to think about it in that way, and if you want to think about your contributions to open source as, as having value, which I think, having just listened to the business panel, we should all be convinced that it, it does have value in, in economic terms. But the problem is that we live in a completely dysfunctional world. <clears throat> 
And it seems to me that the governmental systems that we are ruled by are completely antiquated and they're not using appropriate technologies. I've spoken to a couple of different teams who've worked with lawmakers to codify legislation. And they all say that the processes that are used are arcane, they're antiquated beyond belief. Uh, in some legislations, there is no canonical copy of the codified law. They simply have to go back through several revisions to get to the original law, and so on and so forth. Now, that gave rise to a blog post called Refactor the Law, where I, I maintained that you know, if, if we had a piece of software that had been put together the way the law has been put together, you know, give your local congressman $10 million and you can get your own subroutine that always returns results in lower case, that kind of stuff. If, if, if software was constructed the way law was constructed, then we wouldn't be running computer systems at all, frankly, because it would just be hopelessly, complicatedly uh, subject to the laws of unintended consequences, just the same way that, for example, the tax code is, is frequently. So the Apache Software Foundation may not realize quite what it started by being the first open source foundation. Um, but you, you have got the power by, the, by virtue of your ability to build these amazing technologies that allow us to construct systems uh, that can effectively do things far more complex than, than could ever be controlled manually at, at even a fraction, a significant fraction of the, the volume uh, that data is being handled nowadays. And there, there are some interesting changes as well. I personally feel that open, open office is going to be very interesting for the foundation because suddenly you have a project with a very large user base, almost none of whom are primarily technical. And so it's going to be interesting to, to see how the foundation decides to try to, to interact with, with those people. So the open source world has a lot of good things that it can say about itself. Uh, and it, it, we're living in a time where I think a, a lot of people fear change. And obviously there are there are reasons for them to fear change. I mean, change brings uncertainty, and, and people don't like uncertainty. It, it doesn't allow them to make plans, that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> not only that, but people feel cha uh, fear change, I think, as well, because their circumstances, their material circumstances, have, in many cases, becoming, uh, been becoming worse with every change. And so they see further change uh, as making things worse. And, and I think the, the issue today for... Uh, democratic societies is to try to engage the citizenry. At the moment, it's in vogue to complain about the political process, but yet, even though we claim to be a representative or Republican democracy or whatever, we claim to be a system where voter input is a significant factor in the ruling process, nevertheless, people don't feel that just voting once every two or four years is actually giving them any say in what happens. And I think that the way people's lives have, have changed uh, well justifies that. So Sarah Novotny, who, if you don't know her, is one of the co-chairs of, of OSCON, uh, wrote a couple of years ago um, that we must challenge the idea that if someone really wants to use a piece of software, he or she will be willing to slog through half-written documentation, the actual code base, and an unkind user interface. And she's right. One of the challenges is, as you, you can think of, of the market as we used to when I, I worked at Sun Microsystems a very long time ago now. I was badge number 1532, I think. But there, the market was presented to us technical types as, as being a pyramid with the, the early adopters at the top, the people who would pay top dollar for the latest technology because it would allow them to uh, you know, improve their process, make more profits, whatever. And, you know, finally, down at the bottom of the period, pyramid, you, you enter the mass consumer market. Well, open office is going to suddenly move you a lot closer to the, the mass consumer end of that market. And so you've, you've got some questions to ask yourself. You know, do you actually want to include these people? Do you want to invite them to your conferences? Or, or do you want to be uh, 
a somewhat distant body that's simply responsible for producing the software that, that rules people's lives. And a very interesting topic when we were planning this year's um, ApacheCon was just exactly what concessions we would make to speakers. And I think it's, it's fairly readily understandable as a conference organizer that if I can't attract speakers to the conference, then yeah, I'm not going to be able to attract anyone else, right? If you've got non-entities as speakers, uh, people who don't know their stuff, if we can't get people to submit talks, then uh, we'll not have much of a conference. And uh, yet I find that attitude to be so at odds with the attitude of the Python world that I thought I would like to at least start a discussion this week where you could actually get at me and, and let me know your feelings directly, uh, just to see what, what the difference is between the Python world and the Apache world. In the Python world, uh, the general feeling is that the right way to go is, is to have a, as inclusive a conference as, as we possibly can. And that means that everyone pays. Even Guido Van Rossum, the guy who invented the Python language, pays to go to PyCon. So if anybody used to complain about, you know, well, hey, I'm speaking, why do I have to pay? I just used to say, well, Guido's paying, and that, that solved all the problems. So Jim, get your hand in your pocket next year, and we'll, <coughs> we'll move on. So the open source world has to bear in mind some important human characteristics which have been, I think, notably lacking in the, certainly the two political processes I'm most familiar with, that is the United States and, and the UK, for far too long. Nowadays, political opposition seems to be, seems to be posed in terms of, of complete, uh, completely denying the opponent even so much as the right to exist. And yet, whenever you have any kind of a group at all, whenever you draw any kind of a boundary around a system of any kind, there's an inside and an outside. There's an interface and there's things uh, going on outside that interface. And we have to remember that even people who you know, don't know anything at all about technology have the right to exist, even though they may not, in the Apache Software Foundation's terms, actually possess merit. So people have different comfort levels, and uh, one of the things I struggled very hard with was um, diversity issues within the, the, the Python world. And people don't seem to realize that actually, uh, in order to, to encourage a diverse environment. You don't have to have specific rules of behavior uh, so much as specific rules for making sure that no individual is, is taken or forced outside their comfort level or, or made to feel inferior or unwelcome. And so the, the purpose of the, the code of conduct is simply to explain to people that you know, some behaviors will be unacceptable and, and there are ways for dealing with them. So I think in terms of the challenges, current challenges to the foundation, gender diversity is very definitely an issue. It's one that we've struggled with hard in the Python Software Foundation, and we're still not, we're still not there by a long way, but at least we've made a promising start with the introduction of the, uh, the Pi Ladies chapters. I think they've got 60 chapters now, Python programming for women groups uh, across the world. Um, obviously, with such a diverse range of projects, it's difficult to try and set standards which everyone can sensibly adhere to. And I think that there's, the, I've, from what I've heard so far, there's significant progress being made in, in unifying the, the technical standards. It, it makes sense to unify. And I think that the biggest challenge is actually going to, try, going to be trying to demonstrate relevance to a wider public as the, the foundation's influence continues to grow. So that was all I really wanted to say. Uh, probably no time for questions, unfortunately, but you can, you can find me around at the conference, and these are matters I'm always very happy to discuss. But basically, all I'm trying to say is that um, a commun the more broad and, and the more diverse a community is, the better that is for the community, the more healthy it is, the wider a range of people you will be able to satisfy with the products and the projects uh, that you create. And we need to, I sometimes liken the open source world to people say, well, how, you know, what, what, what goes on in the open source world? What do people do? And I say, well, it's almost as though when President Eisenhower said we need interstates, 
in the 1930s. It's almost as though a bunch of guys said, yeah, that's a great idea, and picked up picks and shovels uh, and went out and started to build them. So the open source world and the Apache Software Foundation in particular has built a huge common good which has generated enormous amounts of economic benefit across uh, a wide range of, of individual organizations. Uh, and if you remember that, that being a member of a community means being prepared to, to accept a constant state of, of mutual obligation, then it will be less difficult to remember that, that not only have you given the world something, but there's something that the world can give you if you'll just open your doors and, and let them in. Thanks very much indeed.